This is genius. This is Joe Rogan, and you're listening to The Gritty Bowman. I've never seen so many mullets in my life. No, it's just about feeling good. You, you had more chins than a Chinese phone book for <laughs> a while. Did, yeah, it, it was, was bad. bad. Yeah. I mean, he's right. He said, Goonies never say die. <laughs> We're going. We got this. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I was pulling the trigger, but the safety was on. <laughs> <laughs> I just Randy Black Not Eagle. Randy that's Black it. Eagle. Boom. That's, that's, my that's how we roll. Just drop <laughs> the mic and walk away. <laughs> Too often. Too need to often. recalibrate. But that one's been money. Like, it's been good. So I'm super happy with that It's one. a little greasy. What are you, too many peanut bars? Oh, peanut dude, butter bars I'm telling today. you. It's probably tears from yesterday. <laughs> we should do a podcast on common law marriage. What we should do. <laughs> Tech tips. What not to do. Oh, uh, Lord. Yeah, you're just too nice and you're... you're I got my ass beat like a rented mule. <laughs> uh, how, do you, how do you say Cadillo. We got to have the, yeah, forget the it. Spanish accent. I can't roll my R's like that, like carne asada. I can't do it. <laughs> Sounds like my, my daughter would say, Dad, you sound like a white dude. So I've got <laughs> I've got poison ivy in this region here, which isn't good. Um, That's getting awful close oh, to the twig and berries. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, but the alpha bow hunting challenge is, by the way, the 29th of April. All right. Are you ready, Ski King? <laughs> Should I tell that story? <laughs> I like that story. Yes, you should. Uh, so, being from Oregon in the small town I was from, I, I had not seen, there was not a lot of ethnic diversity going on there. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, there all, was, it was all white people? White people, yeah. And uh, there was some some brothers and they were, they were skiing. And uh, being, you know, honestly, semi-enamored. Um, like they had, it was a kid in play day, and they had the picks in their hair. <laughs> yeah, and uh, <laughs> so they're skiing, and we're watching. So anyway, one one of the dudes sits on the dock, and he's like, "Man, I'm going for the dock. I'm going for the dock, man." And I'm like, "I don't think this. I mean, I'm I'm a, I'm a little kid, right? A uh, little fat white kid." And uh, I'm like, "Huh." So <laughs> the guy driving the boat yells, "Are you ready, Ski King?" And the guy sitting on the dock goes, "Make it happen, Captain." And he just floors it, and it yanks that dude <laughs> off, smashes his face into the water. The rope just slinkies and flies forward, and it hits the dude driving the boat in the back of the head. And, you know, immediately I'm like, <laughs> you know, like, taken back a bit. And so that stuck in my head until I'm 40 years old now. Uh, Are you, you ready, ready Ski, Ski King? King? <laughs> Even my daughter says it. Or actually what... Uh, she says, and, and, and Amy's both say, is, uh, make it happen, Captain. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I didn't want to do That one happens a lot. Oh, last night, I didn't want to do cardio. I got a migraine from stress, if you can believe that. And uh, I was like, I'm feeling all right. She's like, so are you going to uh, make it happen, Captain? <laughs> so, like, all right, let's go. So, yeah. Oh, man. I did that CrossFit workout at CrossFit Lakewood. Did a bunch of muscle-ups yesterday. And things are feeling a little tight yeah oh yeah for sure hold on we got frank the tank in the background what's up frank hand signals frank he, he only knows the air force sign <laughs> oh and big pimpin is walking in right now we're graced with phil mendoza Ooh, alpha bow hunting on that note make sure everybody sign up for the alpha bow hunting challenge to make fun of luke cadillo from uh gladiators <laughs> unleashed cadillo. the tv show C that has not made it to tv yet cadillo <laughs> cadillo maybe. Uh, I don't know how you say it, but, uh, Phil, how do you pronounce Luke's name? How Phil? do you, how do you say Cadillo? We got to have the, yeah, forget the, it. The Spanish accent. <laughs> I can't roll my R's like that. Like, carne asada. I can't do it. <laughs> Sounds like my, my daughter would say, dad, you sound like a white dude. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, uh, but the alpha bow hunting challenge is by the way, the 29th of April, not this Saturday. But next Saturday, I'm afraid I will be in British Columbia for that. But I'll be rooting everyone on. I'll be there in spirit. I'm going to try to go. I'm. I have plans to be there. Yeah. Uh, but I leave very, very early the next morning for Southeast Alaska. Yeah. For bear hunting. Gotcha. So. Well, cool. Um. Well, so yeah. Should we make it happen, Captain? <laughs> yes, Ski King. <laughs> uh, we're gonna do. Uh, what you know we're just going to go over our camera gear um what cameras we're using why and some of the lenses and you know whatever yeah yeah and we're going to try to keep it 
snappy. In fact, I'm handing Brian my watch. I've got a. Can fifth- I keep it? No. <laughs> this is the only sun toe I've had that doesn't suck. Um, <laughs> you might want to tell people which one this is. I think it's their new core. Um, huh. In fact, a guy from Sunto, and I'm I'm more blunt than probably should be. Yeah, I didn't know he worked for Sunto Western Hunt Expo. Super nice guy. Hey, I got the Sunto. I'm like, yeah, this one's you know not a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, what? And I'm like, well, I ran a Casio Pathfinder because the old one. I just had yeah. bad luck. They would. When I say that, it's not like they broke. The altimeter came off uh, too often. Too you had to often. recalibrate. But that one's been money. Like. It's been good, so I'm super happy with that. It's a little one. greasy. What are you, too many peanut bars? Oh, peanut dude, butter bars I'm telling today. you. There's probably tears from yesterday. <laughs> we should do a podcast on common law marriage. What we should do. <laughs> Tech tips, what not to do. Oh, uh, Lord. Yeah, you're just too nice and you're... you're. I got my ass beat like a rented mule. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, Lordy. All right. It's just life. Yeah, it's life. It's good. Well, the one thing, like glass is half empty, half full. Yeah. Things are going good. I'm healthy. I mean, great people in my life. The support group is a support group. Not only that I have now, it's the support group I've had for quite some time. Yeah. All good things. And you truly see, you know, somebody has a support group all of a sudden out of the blue. <laughs> Probably not a great support group. Yeah. My support group's been here from the beginning and they'll be with me till the end. And I'm super appreciative of that. Not to get kumbaya-ish and start crying, but <laughs> you definitely can see... Who's on your side and, and uh, you know, who's there to help you through the thick and thin of things. Because I've definitely been off my game for a while just from uh, some stuff going on. But things are going good. I mean, can't complain. Suzanne felt real bad. She felt real bad. So she actually baked you cookies yesterday. I ate half of them yesterday <laughs> when we got back. So, yeah, we go to the fire road. I'm walking to these fence posts to find my cookies <laughs> and my the steroid cream for. So I've got <laughs> I've got poison ivy in this region here. <laughs> Which isn't good. Um, That's getting awful close oh, to the twig and berries. Oh, man. So the belt hits the high portion of my pack. So um, you had some steroid cream or Suzanne did. or Anyway, it works yeah. great for uh, for poison ivy. So I found that, put that on, hid the cookies, and then came back down. You should never save the cookies till the end of cardio. Yeah. Because I ate them all because I was hungry <laughs> after cardio. So That's yeah. okay. I mean, that's like the window of gains, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's what I was the excuse. On. I was working on yeah. my gains. <laughs> so, so yeah, we're going to talk about, um, I'm going to do a brief rundown of what camera I've ended up with right now to this day, what cameras I've gone through, quickly what I liked about them and didn't like down them, about them, mm-hmm. um, and maybe what they would work for. I'm going to truly knock this, try to knock this out between five and ten minutes. Um, they're pretty cut and dry. We don't need to go into great depth on what each camera does in my opinion, because it's been done to an irritating level from 14 million different people on YouTube. If you want to find out what the cameras are capable of, go to YouTube. Every every comparison known to man has been done. Mm-hmm. What I'm going to talk about is what's applicable to backpack hunting and why I ended up with these. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'll get started. Um, what I ended up with is this camera that I've actually had before. This is a Sony A7R2. And I have, this is an 85 millimeter Batiste Batis. It depends on, I don't who know. Who you talk to. Who you got talk to. Uh, the A7R2, I believe, is 42 megapixels. So it, it's, it's, it's got a lot of data in the photo. Um, the What I like about this camera best, why I went with it, is the size. Uh, the fact it's 42 megapixels, so it gives me a lot of room to crop or work with it in post-processing. Um, the... The weight, basically, like there's more native lenses now for it that fit my style of photography, meaning I'm mostly a landscape night photographer. Uh, I also do product shots and I guess you'd say adventure photographer, meaning obviously I'm photographing hunts. Don't do a lot of uh, big zooms. I'm not, not not photographing wildlife. wildlife. Yep, things like that. Now, the cameras I've gone through, um, I've had a... Olympus ODEM version one and two. Um, I've had a Nikon D810 and a D800, um, 5D Mark III, 6D uh, from Canon, uh, a Sony A7R, or excuse me, A72, A7S, 
A7S2, and then this one, the A7R2. And I've tried like the 1DX Mark II, screwed around with those. Uh, luckily for me, it, it's nice here because Kefaru uh, has purchased the cameras, um, obviously because I do their marketing, but the photography store I work with, they take trade-ins on used gear, and then I'm able to swap them out without taking a big hit. Um, anyway, the 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 big cameras, the big DSLR full-frame cameras, where those things shine, one is durability. They're they're very durable. Um, arguably, you know, compared to this, they're going to be more water sealed. They're going to be able to take a hit quite a bit better. Battery life on the bigger cameras is. 300 percent to 400 percent better probably i get i get 300 photos out of an a7 r2 battery i got a thousand to 1200 out of a a canon or nikon battery uh depending upon the elements you know that has a big part of it yep now you know going back and forth as far as what's <clears throat> best for backpacking you also have to look again your style me backpacking my style we talked about it Again, if you're backpacking in and doing a, like Darren Epp, sheep, goats, things like that. This wildlife. Probably, wildlife. This is not going to be the best camera for you. You're going to want something with a higher frame rate. You know, pro, you know, 14, like the 1DX is 14 frames per second. Um, and you know, arguably, the, the autofocus on the A7R2 with non-native lenses pretty much sucks um for the most part it does now the autofocus with native lenses arguably better than anything else on the market um the autofocus is amazing with these which in low light not quite there but it doesn't matter because in my low light situation i'm in manual on everything including focus so again i'm going to give this the rundown a7 r2 the size and the weight are a huge thing giant file sizes. I've got a lot of data in that photo to work with. So I can crop, tweak the colors, things like that. The weight of the lenses as well. Now that they have more native lenses, that 18 millimeter actually, which is on the camera we're filming with now, is literally, it's got to be 80% less weight, 60% less weight than the equivalent Canon L series glass. And in my opinion, there is no difference nope. in quality i mean it's phenomenal crisp sharp sharp and that's it's an 18 millimeter one eight that's on there this here 85 millimeter and this is also excuse me that's a 18 2.8 yeah two eight uh this is an 85 miller millimeter one eight batiste this isn't even their highest end which is their g series or whatever they call this thing one i guarantee it's half or less of the weight of a canon l85 unbelievable bokeh it is very very sharp last the other day we were doing cardio i took some photos of the dogs I, those were handheld photos rednecking around i had the camera about an hour when i got them back i wasn't even really paying that much of attention so i'm able to um basically have this camera the a7r2 out way more because it's smaller easier to deal with um, file sizes are huge the format on this camera sucks. I set up all custom settings. Uh, it's just not that easy to work with. But once you learn it and you get it set up for yourself, I don't see a problem with it personally. How much time? How am I doing? You're doing good. Okay. You, you've been about five minutes. Um, so uh, the other thing, um, that which I guess is a positive thing for me, is this tilt screen because I do a lot of this stuff. Okay. If you're not, if you're if you're listening at home, I've got the tilt tilt screen tilt it out so I'm holding it well below eye level and I can watch the viewfinder. I also like on the, this has an EVF viewfinder. So with the EVF uh, viewfinder, I actually like that better. Um, there's some pros and cons to it, but, um, but now for the negatives, just to get those out of the way, battery life, we talked about that before, mm -hmm. horrible. Uh, single SD card slot never has bit me in the butt, but it could. You could lose all the files on that card. One thing I will do when I take photos with this, um, let's say um, one one trip in, and I, I have extra XD, SD cards, I will pop that uh, SD card out and pop in a new one. So that way, if, it, you know, not, if anything does happen, I've got the first portion saved and I do swap out the SD cards frequently. Uh, the other thing, you know, that you need to look at, I guess, when you're... Um, deciding on the a7 r2 if you're liking the sony's and the a7 s2 um a7 s2's video it's better for video the a7 r2 is better better for photography um it was a hard decision i had uh 5d mark fours 
Uh, I talked to uh, the peeps here. They were cool with me trading them in, um, you know, just to get the size a little bit smaller, um, you know, my pack weight a little bit farther down. So I went down and talked a little bit with the rep about the issues I had with the last camera. One of the issues I had uh, with the A7R2 was the sensor. It got dirty a lot because if you take this off, for those watching, that shiny thing you see in there is the sensor, and mm -hmm. it's up close and personal, so it can get dirty really easy. And I was getting the sensor cleaned once every couple months um, where I didn't have that problem. So durability with the A7R2 I don't think is good is as good. Well, I know it's not as good as the Canons and the Nikons. I will say I've never fried a Sony, and I use the Sony more than any other camera in adverse weather conditions. Never fried one. I fried three Canons and a Nikon and an Olympus. Um, when I say fried, water damage, whatever the case may be. Um, so that's the down and dirty. I mean, I, I could probably go into great much more detail. Uh, but A7R2, because of the size, because of how crisp... Uh, the images are and how much I can work with them uh, was the biggest decision for me going back to these. Um, I don't think I'll need to go into this. We can hit all these parts and pieces later. We talked so about the, the strap and the, the peak design many times before. Yeah. I mean, other than that. Uh, uh, lenses. Inside, for for me, inside my bag. Um, I'd like to know, yeah, what lenses you're running. You're... If, if I, I, I'll tell you what I run and what I suggest to people. A wide angle if you're going to be outdoors. And you need it at 2.8 for sure, meaning you need a fast aperture. Um, you need a fast lens. Figure out what that is if you don't mm -hmm. know what it means for night photography. So that's an 18 2.8, uh, Canon 16 to 35. They're 14 millimeter 2.8. Um, Nikon's could probably got one of the best landscape lenses in their 14 millimeter 2.8. You need something wide and fast. And then I'll bump up from a somewhere in that 14 to 16 millimeter, 18 millimeter range, I'm going to bump up to a 35 or a 50 for my walk around lens. I cater more to the 35 because of camp shots. Again, I try not to get any lenses slower than a 2.8 for what I do. Uh, the next I would suggest would be a somewhere in the 85 to 100 millimeter range. Uh, that's good for product shots. That's good for basically having a really nice bokeh in, in, in really less shallow depth of field. Um, it's a great portrait lens and I don't pack it in the woods all the time, but I do take quite a bit of photos with it. After that, you know, you super zooms, you know, 24 to 70 standard zooms. I, all of that stuff is just going to depend on the type of photography you're doing. In my case, I can get away with three lenses for the most part. Um, wide angle, 35 to 50, and then an 85. I can get everything done for the most part I need to get done. Everything else, I have a pile of batteries, cleaning system. You want to get a hurricane blower? I will show what that is. Um, tell me the exact, because I assume you went through a lot of research to determine which lens you actually bought. Because there's a lot of options out there. Like if you want a 1.8 or 2.48 or a 1.4, what, what are the actual models? Um, so the, the 18 millimeter two, eight Zeiss Batiste is, it was tough between that and the 21 millimeter lo lo Loxia Loxia. Mm -hmm. Um, I went with the 18 millimeter for no other reason than it was a little bit wider and that's it. Um, yeah. the reviews were, it also has auto focus, focus and then Loxia doesn't. And, and for that. For not what a big I deal use for it you. for, it's not as big of a deal for that. Now, with mm -hmm. a 35 or 50, totally different story. My wide angle, I'm doing mostly everything in manual anyway. Um, but, yeah, it does have autofocus, which would be huge for a lot of people. Um, yeah, I, I waited out, and I, I, went, I, uh, I would choose the 18 over the Loxia because it's a little bit wider, just like you said. Mm -hmm. But also that autofocus factor is huge. And then all the reviews I saw comparing them side by side – like nine out of ten gave the slight edge to the, the, Batiste, the Batiste or Battis or whatever. Yeah. I don't know how to pronounce it. The Bravo. Um, so yeah, I that's the one I went with for the, the Sony. It's a prime lens, series. eighteen millimeter, two point eight Zeiss Battis. Yep, and I'm a prime guy, so all mine are primes. The next one, I've got the thirty five millimeter. I'll actually pull it out here. This was a tougher decision. Uh this is a thirty five one four. 
it's only tougher because it's heavy and it's expensive. Um, I normally probably could not have um, afforded this lens uh, just for the simple fact it's sixteen hundred dollars. <laughs> um, but for it makes up for it with the marketing aspect of it for Kafaru. Uh, in the sense, I guess what I'm getting at is if you're doing photography for a living, one, you're probably not listening to us anyway, but two, if you're trying to get to that point, sometimes it's worth it. You yeah. Know, the one four, you're paying for that couple stops down. Um, that's a big one. You can manually here uh, adjust for your aperture where you can adjust it manually or just click it over, go to auto, and then I'm adjusting it in the body um, as mm -hmm. well. Um I think you're going to get one of these, right? Yep. That's my next lens. Yeah. It's it's a good lens. Um, and I, I, again, when I traded the stuff in, I was trying to get close to what I had in the, the Canon, Canon stuff. And so with the Canon, I had the 350 or whatever they call it, but I also had a, a pretty kick butt 24 millimeter. Um, you know, they kind of equal each other out. So the next one is this 85. And this is... It's not that heavy. There's kind of a gimmicky thing up here. I'm not going to talk about that. But this is the Batiste 1885. And that last one was a Zeiss 1.4, 35 millimeter. 35 millimeter, 1.4 Zeiss Batiste. This is the Batiste That's a as Batiste well. as well? Yep. And that one that, is too. Honestly, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, it's the Batiste. Um, yeah. And then this one is as well. Now, with the 85, this takes amazing portrait shots. Um which, you know, you start figuring out portrait shots, camp shots or portrait shots sometimes, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. and, you know, also the grip and grins and everything else. Um, they say the 85 G series is better than that one. Yeah. it it Reading through it, there was... Kind of the, split. Well, the weight, man. The weight yeah, of that G series. No, no doubt. I, I basically would have been picking up the Zeiss or the Canon L series 85. And if any of you photographers out there have used that... It weighs a metric ton. I'm not <laughs> kidding you. It is heavy. You could kill a grizzly bear on crack with that thing. It's heavy. Where this one, 70, 80% is a reduction in weight. Yeah. And I can't tell. Honestly, I think this is better than that 85L. Yeah. I can't say for the G series because I literally picked it up and put it back in the box <laughs> yeah, and gave it back to them. It's too heavy. Yeah, it's just too heavy. And the other day, I, I went up the tower trail with this mm -hmm. around my shoulder. We were running and... With this, the one thing I was able to do because of that super low, low, low depth of field I could get down to one eight, I like getting for whatever reason my dog, well, Amy's dog, but our dog's hair, hair's face, right? You can mm -hmm. the dog tongue hanging out, slobber, and then this like bokeh, like this this really diffused rich. or whatever you want to call it, rich, yeah, background um, and a rich face. Um, I said that backwards, but either way, mm -hmm. I really like it. Um, you know. A lot of guys are probably thinking you're out of your mind. Uh, we can't afford that. Again, I the highest camera I was able to afford was like an Olympus. Um, after that point, when I started working here, you know, obviously they helped out because I'm taking photos for Kafaru. Brian, you do it for a living with a gritty Bowman. It's more easy to justify. If you've got the money, get get good glass, get a good camera. It's going to be well worth it. Um, you know, you just, you need to get the camera that applies to what you're doing. Yep. So. I think, uh, I went with the Sony, um, I, I used to have this Canon 70D, mm -hmm. which was a crop sensor, HD camera, no 4K, very, very inexpensive camera, touchscreen. It was a great camera to learn on. Mm -hmm. And most of the Gritty Bowman has been built off of that Canon 70D. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it, uh, it's it's a solid camera it's pretty cheap and you can get lenses like the nifty 50 for like 100 bucks yeah uh, a 50 millimeter 1.8 and get good images so uh but naturally as you as you get into this game uh you progress and you grow and, and you want to continually improve what you're doing and that meant it was time to go to 4k yeah and the other problem that i run into a lot with filmmaking is um just low light uh the Canon um, 70D is a, just a real, you know, inexpensive uh, consumer camera, really. It's, it's a workhorse <clears throat> mid-grade. Yeah. You know, I yeah. would say somewhere in that neighborhood, you know. Um, there's a lot of other cameras now that are just uh, at, around that. So 
you know, that same price tag that I would highly recommend over the Canon at this point. So uh, having gone down the Sony Alpha mirrorless path, here for a while now. Bit of a rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm completely 100% sold on this camera. And um, so... Not to lengthen Brian's time, but you had doubts at first. Oh, and dude. I think it's important for people to know that. And it wasn't the camera's fault. I had doubts when I got it too. So The first time I got it, we used it for a month. And I was like, I can't use this, Aaron. <laughs> I can't. I, I'm going back to the Canon. It's just the menu system... The lack of a touch screen, um, it just kept all counterintuitive to me. It, w it was a pain. It was a nightmare. So, And here I am with a new Canon. Yeah. Saying, yeah, go to Canon. And then, <laughs> yeah, anyway. <laughs> and, and as I, but as I looked into it and, I, and since learned, I can't recommend the, the Alpha mirrorless enough. So um, it records in 4K. That's, that's a decision I've made going forward. Everything, I'm going to try to film everything I can in 4K for for many reasons, but mostly um, down the road, five years from now, 4K will still be um, uh, a frame, uh, a uh, an, an image that is still very usable. Pleasing. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. As people progress from HD into 4K, um, it's also more scale. Like I can crop an image, so you know where I'm filming Aaron stock a, a buck, and he's uh, 200 yards away. Um, when I put a long lens on there and zoom out, I, I really need to capture it. And if he's a dot on the screen back there, that's a problem. So in 4k, I can film him out there. And then when I get home, I can crop the image down to show Aaron or, or, or maybe it's more intuitive to say I can blow the image up, zoom in when I get home to show Aaron close up. And I can't do that with, I can't do that in 1080p. And get a good image out of it like I can in 4K. I think a good example on the photography side, so people understand, that deer that you have um, for a photo um, in the snow, that was with a 70 to 200 lens literally cropped beyond belief. And that photo is still yeah, and Aaron's, very clear. In Aaron Snyder's photography store on Gritty Bowman's site, if you go there, you'll see, um, I think it's called Frost or something like yeah, that. Yeah, There's a, there's a, beautiful buck that Aaron has an image of with that's that's just standing there and popping out in this in and it's all snow. You film you took a ton of photos um with a 70 to 200 lens. Yep. And um in raw with the biggest image you can. You came home and you know I was a ways away and they, it just wasn't that zoomed in. It's a dot. Yep. Yep. And then you crop in and it's like he fills the frame and you don't lose any resolution. Because the file was so big, like 4K and video, mm -hmm. that I could crop down and I still had a 12 or 14 megabyte photo. Uh, where if I would have done that with a different camera, it would have been like two or three and yep. very, very grainy and, and, and ugly. So the same works with video. Exactly. The other thing that's nice is you can get motion. So you can, uh, it. let's say you have a... a um, an, a two by two foot image, mm -hmm. let's say, and the elk is like the size of your hand and it's moving across that two by two foot image. You can actually crop in on that elk or blow that elk up and have it move across that image. Um, so you can get, you can look like you panned yep. to follow the elk and you can do that with time lapses and things like that, where it looks like you're moving the camera, um, during the time last, but you weren't, you did that all in post. So hopefully that makes sense. But basically 4k just is powerful. So I wanted to do to, to record in 4k. Now, when you're, uh, the other thing is with DSLR cameras, and I spent a lot of time looking at footage this last, this over this last six months, I've been running the Sony on like auto ISO. Um, in fact, just auto video. And, and it, it works like a camcorder, much like a, uh, it'll work just like my, um, like a GoPro. You turn it on, it just, it just determines auto exposure. It's very handy in the heat of the moment. Just boom, I'm there and I'm recording. Uh, and I get a crisp, clean 4K image. But it's just like a regular camcorder. The downside there is, uh, and the whole reason I record on a DSLR is to get that blurry bokeh look that's what makes it feel cinematic um 
you know, when you, we just did a podcast on the gritty angler with, uh, Derek Oltheus, who, uh, is part of Western waters media, uh, trout Academy. And those guys, along with Phil Tuttle, they've, they do some pretty cool filmmaking and, uh, and then they also do great photography and I'm, I'm looking through their, their pictures and I'm, and we did a podcast with them recently on their camera gear and how they like to photograph fish. It's specifically around filming fish, fly fishing, jumping trout, moving fish, which in hunting, I haven't had to film fast moving objects. Yeah. Except for when you like shoot a bow and then I just turn it up to 220 frames per second or whatever. And I record slow motion. Yeah. So this was a little different. And, um, so I learned a lot from them lately that I like to apply. But one of the things when I'm shooting with a DSLR is I want that blurry look. And Aaron, if you put your hand in front of your face like this and you're looking at it and it's, it's a foot from you, your the background is blurry. Mm -hmm. Like it's not in focus. Our eyes naturally do what the DSLR camera is able to do. Yeah which means it, it, you're able to focus on an obje object while everything behind it is blurry or everything in front of it is blurry. That's how the human eye works. Mm -hmm. And it could explain why we all kind of like that look so much. Yeah. But when I'm filming a subject, for example, that's what I want. I want the, I want it to be, uh, I want that bokeh yeah. in a lot of my footage. So... In order to accomplish that, it's just a DSLR is the way to go. And if you're going to run a DSLR and you're going to go through the work or a mirrorless camera, I should say, or, you yeah, know, full frame, full frame, whatever. if you're going to run it like that, then you got to have fast lenses. Yeah. Unless you're running a red that's yeah. 18,000. What's it? What is it? I don't know. 40,000. Yeah, they're expensive. Something like that. Something beyond the uh, pay grade of the gritty. Yeah. <laughs> so... That means I need a fast lens. So like Aaron said, like this 1.4 that he has. Um, Brian's got a little video wood over that thing. Yeah. This 1.4 is super fast. It means the iris in this lens is going to be wide open and it's going to give you a really nice bokeh effect. Um, the depth of field is really small, you know. Um, so autofocus is really handy. Yeah. Really helpful when you have, when you're, when you're filming live and if my depth of field is only three inches. As I say, one four, for those that don't know, means the depth of field, my nose could be in focus and my earlobe could be out of focus. Yep. That, that, that much distance will make that, that it's that critical. Sorry, go ahead. Yep. So if I'm filming Aaron with that setting in place and he rocks forward and he rocks back while he's telling that story. He comes in and out of focus constantly. Yeah. But I might want that tiny, small, narrow net depth of field to get um, some dramatic effect out of it. Or like if I have a fish and a guy's holding it in front of him and he's got it in both hands like this, I don't actually want to see the guy. Yeah. See I, the colors of the fish. I want the everything. fish. Yep. So when he holds that fish in front, I have such a narrow depth of field. Now, if he moves that fish forward or back two inches or three inches it can pop in and out of focus, which is annoying. So with the Sony, I've learned how to set it up with follow focus or I don't know what they call it, but... Track focus. Track focus. It's a name for... Basically, you set it up on the person's face. You can do continuous focus, which is what I've been doing, where wherever the, you know, the focus screen is, it locks onto that and whatever's in that, that center box, section center whatever. section. Yeah is what's going to be in focus. You pop that fish on there. And then as they move in and out, the, the focus follows it. That yeah. depth of field follows it. Um, you said it can lock on eyes on a, or a face or something. I'm, I know the Canon does. I'm not a video guy, but just watching all the different tutorials yeah. on stuff, they were, I watched a video, a, a lady was just walking down the walkway zooming and they were filming the screen and that box was, I mean, it was like track point, man. It was yeah. like, wow. And it was on like Donkey Kong all the time. So. And so that's very important when you have a shallow depth of field and the only thing in focus is that person's head and anything behind the head or in front of the head is out of focus. If they're, if they're, uh, you know, um, if I'm doing an interview with Aaron and I just want to really focus on him and, and block everything out, uh, I can, I can use that out of focus and, and really follow him around and, and keep that image in place. 
So here's where the kicker is with video compared to photography is um, if I film wide open, which is the goal to give me that look often, I have the aperture set fully wide open. The next thing is uh, shutter speed. Mm -hmm. And in video, the, generally the rule is you want to film uh, at, a frame, at a shutter speed that's two times your, your frame rate. Mm -hmm. So your frame rate is how many frames per second you're recording your video in. So for, for, for movies, for cinema, they typically do 24 frames per second which is uh, basically an old throwover from what, how I understand it. Um, back in the day, they figured out what's the fewest number of frames in one second can you film and have it not be glitchy. Yep. Yeah, that is where it came from, and I don't know where I <laughs> To save money that, from yeah. on camera because film was expensive, and so they figured out 24. Yeah. And even today, they're still using 24. Our eyes, and we're used to it, and... That's just how, um, that's how the how the world is. We're kind of used to consuming our films, so we're used to the look of that. Um, but now with cameras, you can record at thirty frames per second, which is typical for TV, and um, you can do sixty frames per second if you want to film a little faster. So you can slow, you can uh, slow it down to to do slow motion or one hundred twenty frames per second. Um, or 220, and um, that's just more frames, more photographs, basically, more frames captured in a one-second period. So there, when you slow it down, there are no no glitches. Um, and so... I was thirsty. Yeah. So, so, again, shutter speed needs to be two times your frame rate. So I actually... And this is just personal preference, and and I've asked around, and I've I've done some some following, but twenty four frames per second, I don't like it. Mm -hmm. Generally, I don't like it. Um, it feels like uh, it's not as crisp. Uh, it it does have that cinematic feel, but it I don't I don't uh, I just I like a crisper image, one that and with the cameras today and in four K, I just feel like I get a better look when I do thirty frames per second. Mm -hmm. So that's just me, uh, and it kind of boils down to per personal preference. So I've been I've been recording a lot lately on 4K uh, at 30 frames per second. Um, it's different if you're going to submit your film into some indie film festival or whatever where they want it at a certain frame rate, like 24 or something like that. But for me and for YouTube and for purposes of uh, Vimeo and Instagram, uh, I'm doing 30 frames per second. So 4K, 30 frames per second, and... Um, megabytes per second i do that as high as i can uh which is you know um the processing speed yeah is... i have no idea even how that works thank god i'm a photographer and basically <laughs> i just shoot for the highest number so if i can record 4k at 30 frames at 100 i would i believe on the sony uh, it's uh, 50 is as high as it'll go uh at that frame rate and and in 4k um but basically um Basically, I'm at 4K, 30 frames per second. So that means my shutter speed needs to be 1 60th. Yep. So the, it's 1 30th would match my frame frame rate. 1 60th would be two times my frame rate at 30 frames per second times 2, 60. So 1 60th would be my shutter speed. That'll give me that look where I'm not ghosting, where my hand's not getting blurry when I'm, you know, as I move it back and forth. Yeah. Um, glitchy it locks up too i guess mm -hmm. you could say locks up but. so i got my aperture wide open and i have my my shutter speed at two times my frame rate um that means to achieve exposure all i've got left is iso and uh and if it's dark or low light um that means uh so my i pr pretty much try to shoot for my my aperture and my and my shutter speed being fixed based on the look I want for that shot. Mm -hmm. So if i am got too much light coming in, uh, I got to drop down my ISO as low as I can go, down to like 100. Which you want to pretty much, in for, for photo especially, shoot in the lowest ISO you can and still get the quality you're wanting or the 
the light level you're wanting because it gets grainy when the ISO is too high. Um, and and the same is true for video. Yeah. Um, it gets noisy and you lose, uh, you lose that image, the quality of the image. So um, the problem is, and so I want to go open it up as much as I can if it's dark mm -hmm. to let in more light. Generally, um, um, uh, with this Sony, I can, I mean, Matt at Rock House, mm -hmm. um, he told me, um, you know, he's, he, he's like on the Sony a7S2, he'll, he'll run it at 2000 ISO and it won't be grainy. Which is pretty amazing. I mean, I don't think people, you know, people that are photographers and videographers realize 2000 ISO is pretty high. Ridiculous. I mean, they say, you know, it'll go to 158,000, something that doesn't make any sense anyway. But like for photography, 1600, that's as high as I go. I, yeah. mean, I just, I don't need to. Now, I will screw around, but in my opinion, anything after 1600 ISO, it's not as, it's still usable. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's arguable what usable even means, but it's still a photo I look at and I'm like, wow, no grain, smooth, silky sky. After 1600, you start to get some grain, grainy look. And, and, and compare that to the Canon 70D, where over 250, 300 ISO, I was, I was introducing some graininess. Above 500, it's shot. You know, uh, you could still record, but it just isn't the same. So the Canon is a low, or the Sony uh, Alpha is a low light monster. Yeah. So it's really really the way to go um and for me so the sony i'll 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 get that iso at that point where i like i said i'll i'll raise it up as high as i need to to let as much light in or i'll lower it yeah as much as i need to, to get the light out this is where something else comes into play that i'm still new to and i'm figuring out and that's in in a variable nd filter so a lot of the, you know, as I talked to the guys over at, uh, you know, Western Waters and a few other people that do a lot of DSLR film work, uh, and basically a, an ND filter is like sunglasses for your camera. It enriches for photography. It, it enriches the, the colors sort of, I guess you could say, mm -hmm. is it, it makes it a, I don't know if creamier, I don't use, I don't have to use ND filters. I can do it in post-processing. You cannot do that with, we get away with a lot in photography more than yeah. you can. And, you know, you, you basically, um, they'll shoot in picture profile two. Is it two? I don't know. I mean, they'll, people. Brian Broderick was explaining mm -hmm. to me and I'm like, whatever. dude. <laughs> yeah. That's a whole nother section, uh, S log and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, you know, that's another area where I'm not very skilled in. Um, it does look good when you figure it out. Though. It does. Holy cow. Yeah. And you use a lookup table yeah. a lot and you can color grade your, your content to have a nice look to it. Um, like Lord of the Rings has a kind of a color tone and cast to the whole film. Yep. Um, you can do that to your work. It's very cinematic. You know, a lot of films and movies have that. Um, that's something else, but on an indie filter, you, you, the variable one, it mounts to the front of the camera and I can twist it left or right to darken or lighten the, the sunglass effect, mm -hmm. you know? And so that means now I can actually run the camera on the settings I want for the look I want. So I have the aperture wide open mm -hmm. to give me the bokeh and, and that blurriness. Yeah. I have the shutter speed at two times my frame rate frame rate to give me the, the nice crisp uh, image and I have my ISO down where it's not causing any noise or introducing any issues. Um, and then I use the ND filter to to get my exposure to darken that image down to a level where I'm still getting the cinematic look I want, but I have a clear, crisp image. And, and the ND, a variable ND filter, in my opinion, for photography is not a good idea. They don't, they don't, you don't get the image you want. It, it doesn't make sense because you guys can jack up your shutter speed. Well, here, here's the thing to, to not to confuse people. If I'm going to take a water photo and I want to make that water look without ripples, basically one sheet. Yep. And it's daylight. I'm going to put a 
depending upon the daylight, a fairly dark, fairly higher level ND filter. Um, because what that's going to allow me to do is fake my camera into thinking it's it's late, not fake it, but kind of fake it. So I can open up my shutter speed or lengthen my shutter speed. So when I lengthen my shutter speed, if the ND filter was not on, it would just be blown out completely because there's too much too light. much light. The ND filter is faking that so the shutter stays open and it gets that water moving. So then it looks like it's one sheet, one smooth sheet or one smooth sheet coming down. If you ever wonder how people get these, what's that little dude in Oregon's name? Kobe Hill. Mm -hmm. He does some photo. He does some pretty cool, cool stuff. photos. I think he's 17. Um, <laughs> I think young he's guy. 20 yeah, now or yeah, something. But yeah. I don't know if he's even that. <laughs> Maybe I, you're right. Uh, he's young though, yeah. but he's either way, he's a great photographer. He does a lot of water stuff. So Brian and I roll up and we have this crazy waterfall, screw in an ND filter, how I do it anyway. Once I screw the ND filter on, uh, I'll generally turn my histogram on because I'll, I'll still use that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to jack up the shutter speed to where it literally was a night shot, for, for the most part, or a very low light Which shot. Which means that window is going to open for five seconds? Quite a while. 20 seconds? Yeah. Well, for me, if I want to, a lot of times... I've done some pretty cool stuff with ND filters. I've done some ND filters pitch black at night, which makes no sense. But then I'll do a 30-second shutter speed mm -hmm. on a corner of a street. It's insane. I mean, yeah, you get, yeah it's crazy. Because the lights blur. Well, it's just one long beam. Mm -hmm. Same thing for water. I'll bump up my, my depth of field quite a bit to get a long streak of the, of the creek. It turns the whole because now my depth of field or my clear the, the the depth of clarity I have in my photo is great. You know, it's, it's it's forty, fifty, sixty feet or more of of almost perfect clarity. Now I have a forty, fifty, sixty foot solid sheet of water because my my shutter's open that long. It takes a lot more. It probably sounds probably simpler than it is. It's a pain to get it right, but. Do not get a variable ND filter for photography for the simple fact they suck when it comes to clarity. It works for videography mm -hmm. from what I've seen. With foot photography, to get that silky smooth, crisp, um, sharp image, the ND filter has some haze or whatever. It doesn't have it throughout the entire um, you know, aperture yeah. or whatever. But either way. Yeah, you're giving up some clarity. Like the, the, the ND filter I bought is a Tiffin. It's like 120 bucks screws on there and they're, they go up to, I don't know, five, $700 for just a little piece of glass that Ridiculous. screws on. Yeah. So they, you know, in, in theory, the higher you go up, the, the, the better that is. But, uh, now I've been watching footage where they're using that, that filter. Um, and as much as they might lose a little, like Aaron said on video with 4k, you, you might lose, uh, maybe some color or, or it might that shade kind of takes away some crispness um, on the Tiffin. I don't notice it at all. And I'm still, I, I don't see it. Um, I, I just if you're a pixel peeper, I think on a camera, it. you can see maybe details like that. And what do you get is basically distortion or edge to edge clarity yeah. issues. You get quite a bit of um, well, with a cheap on the edges. With a cheap variable ND filter, you can get an X where, you know, you have a super dark here and the bottom of the X and you can get these weird, um, uh, cause the indie, it's like two pieces of glass. And as you twist them, it makes it get darker or lighter. Yep. And so sometimes you can get where uh, on a cheap one or in the right conditions where that indie filter causes, uh, an X to show up in, in exposure across your image. Yeah. No, that's exactly what happens. Um, we went through three of them because I was hoping it would be the right. Yeah. It's just. It's tough. It, I, well, I just don't think it. I think it just makes more of a difference with the photo because it's one frame, basically. Yeah. And you're looking at that one frame. And in the case of water, which mm -hmm. is when you're going to usually use it, you have a giant whitish sheet and you, with a dark edge. And that dark can grade from inside yeah. to out. And that's where it would happen is it would, it would be like taking a wide angle shot with a cheap lens. Mm -hmm. You would have edge issues. You're right. Right. And that's what would happen. Now, if I just maxed it, mm -hmm. it worked great when I maxed it. Um, well, so for film, it's kind of the only option if, is, you yeah. wanna, <laughs> if you want to, if you want to, so if you have an expensive 1.4 lens like Aaron has, 
And my buddy just caught, a, a, you know, a, a beautiful fish of a lifetime. He pulls this big giant brown trout out and, um, and I want to get a video of this thing, uh, with that bokeh and that cinematic look and it's middle of the day and super bright. Um, my frame rate again, uh, my shutter speed is two times my frame rate, one sixtieth. I've got my, um, my aperture at 1.4. I've got my ISO down to 100. Yeah, it's still going to be blown out. It's without still, that filter. It, yeah, it's just brighter <laughs> than hell. Yeah. So I put that filter on and I get that down to my exposure level. I like to get my exposure level down around, you know, negative 0.07 or negative one, mm -hmm. um, somewhere between zero and one, uh, underexposed. And once I get it there, Boom, man, I got that. I got that video. Um, I've got the autofocus on the fish and the depth of field is sticking with it as it moves around and, and your eye just, boom, pops on the fish and it's not distracted by the guy in the background, by the grin he's got on his face. It's not, you know, distracted by anything, you know, in, you know, you could have cars driving by and it looks like that fish is caught in the wilderness of Alaska. Yeah. Right. So, um, very cool. You can only do that with that ND filter. And so that's the, a new toy that I'm, I'm playing with because the whole point of having those fast lenses is for that cinematic look. Now, sometimes I want everything in focus from infinity and beyond. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's perfectly doable by just raising that aperture up, you know, F11 or something. Yeah. Um, and, and you can do that, but most of the time, what I'm looking for, for all my close-up shots, Aaron and I having an interview or talking or, or walking or an ant on a log, I, I want, I want that cinematic bokeh in the frame. Yeah. And it's different with, with photography, not different, but as far as, um, you know, if you're taking a photo of whatever, some landscape photo, depending upon what you're wanting out of it. Mm -hmm. I was just talking to a guy, great depth about this. You have some driftwood. Yep. At the beginning of the lake, that is now, that's, that's, that's me. That's it. That's what I want. Yep. And so I may drop my, uh, depth of field down to maybe not one, four, one, eight, but maybe two, eight, uh, pretty low. Um, and then, you know, I'm still going to have the lake and the mountain range in the background getting blurry and blurrier as it goes back. But that driftwood is just some amazing piece. It's archaic. It's got lots of cracks in it. But take the driftwood out as far as composing the shot. Mm -hmm. I don't want the driftwood. Now, I just went from like F2845, whatever, 35 or whatever. Um, now, I'm probably at F11 to F22. Who knows? Mm -hmm. And I'm zooming in to see what. Now, I want everything clear because my composure or filling my frame with my shot, right? What I want went from a piece of driftwood to a mountain range. Yep. And it all depends on what you want. And, and all that's aperture. Yeah, it's all aperture. The other stuff for me for photography is relatively relatively simple. I don't it's it it comes pretty quick once you learn it. But yeah. It's a fun I mean you learn it every day with this. Yeah. The other thing that I learned with the Sony was um um there there's some cool features that the Sony has that blow your mind. Uh one of them is the uh, clear image zoom. Yeah. So a lot of people don't seem to know this because I've shared this with a few people recently and, um, the, and they, they had never heard of it. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of popping out on the forums and some YouTube videos. I'm starting to see it lately, but basically inside the Sony, if you go through the menu, you can find zoom mode. I think it's zoom mode or something like that. Where and then you go in there and it's you can have it set to what they have is optical zoom, yeah, which is strictly just your, your lens on your camera, digital zoom, which is a built-in like electronic zoom that's standard yeah. on most DSLRs, yeah, that's not worth a damn, yep. <laughs> and then they have Sony has what they call clear image zoom, mm -hmm. and clear image zoom, um, you turn that on, turn your camera, your Sony on to clear image zoom. And then uh, I create a shortcut button for zoom mm -hmm. uh, the, on the menu. So uh, like C4 is what I've been using down here on the corner, custom button number four. I can uh, set that to zoom. So when I'm 
filming, let's say I run, I have my 70 to 200 millimeter lens on there. Let me get mine because I think it's called Super 35 or something crazy on there. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Super 35 is basically a, a 1.5 crop factor yeah. on, on your shot. Uh, so when you have that zoom turned on, so I'll have my 200 millimeter lens fully out as far as it'll go. When I click zoom, I can zoom in by 2x. It's like having a doubler on there, except that you don't lose any f-stops. There's no decrease in light or image quality as far as I can tell. So I just basically have a 70 to 200 millimeter lens just went to a 400 mil millimeter lens. Just like that. Now, it, just because I don't, I don't really have to mess with any mm -hmm. of this. Um, what I was doing, if I go from APS-C to Super 35 or vice versa, um, if I go to um, APS-C, it just made this from um, 85 to a 170 millimeter. Yes. Yeah. It doubles my zoom because um, when, you, when I go from Super 35 to APS-C or vice versa. Yep. So the, on the as the way I understand it, with the A seven R two, you can t change it to a crop sensor camera, yep. basically. Yep. And that's what that's what that says. That's what is. that it doubles it up. Yep. yep. So one point five, right? I think it's one point five. Honestly, I'm it is. Spirit of honesty, I've never had to use it, but yeah, one point five. So, but what's cool about that is, so on this lens that Aaron has, it's a thirty five millimeter, a one point four thirty five millimeter. Uh, it's now a 70 millimeter. Yeah. Um, a 35 to 70. Yeah. It's a prime, but you can actually zoom in and uh, it's very cool. You know, you just turn on the, the zoom and you just push this little d dial here and it just plus or minuses and you're, you're just able to get this cool shot. I mean, just that much closer. So clear image zoom, I don't know how it's working, but it doesn't appear to, on video especially, it seems to be magical um that has really changed my idea on how to film um you know on what lenses to buy as well um because you can have a 200 millimeter lens that's really a 70 to 400 millimeter lens just like that so it's it's incredible um it's funny i i showed it to to phil the other day phil tuttle yeah and uh and I, I was like, I, dude, explain to me, how does it work? Um, and uh, he told me my simple mind probably couldn't figure it out. Um, but, uh, you know, it's something to do with um, Sony's magic. Well, Broderick showed you that down there on his little camera, didn't he? The, um, yes, he the did. The clear image zoom? I don't, if, if he did, I missed it. Okay, I couldn't remember because he was asking me. I'm like, dude, I don't film. So no, I don't <laughs> think he he was aware of it. Oh, gotcha. But I I could be wrong. Uh, he was showing me other things that were really useful. Oh, gotcha. Because I well, I couldn't remember either. But he was asking me on the photography side for what I do. I don't ever. I just use my legs because I'm not. That's not the type of photography mm -hmm. I do. I only need to scoop forward a few feet or back a few feet. So um, not as big of a deal for, for me with when what I've got going on. When you're filming, <clears throat> one thing that's difficult with the DSLR is I actually have a 24 to 240 that Broderick recommended. It doesn't, it's not a fast lens. I think it starts at 3.5 aperture. So you're, you're, you're not going to get that blurry look. Mm -hmm. But you have a very low end at 24 millimeter wide angle. Yeah. So I can like grab Aaron in the shot next to me, uh, right over his shoulder and then quickly pop out, zoom out to 240, and then hit the clear image zoom and be out to 480. Yeah. 480. Yep. Like that all in one lens. So I have a very low end, um, uh, uh, millimeter wide angle, wide yeah. angle and a, and a super telephoto. Yeah all in that little, little deal. And it gives me a crisp 4k. So it's, and it's lightweight. It can just be on that peak designs and Broderick handheld it and zoomed all the way out at 240 to film me shooting that whitetail buck, hand holding it, yeah, it with was image stabilization. Good. Solid. Yeah. yeah Great the, the, 4k. The five axis image stabilization in the Sony's is off the charts. Yeah. It's pretty dang good. So to throw that on a monopod or something, 
and be able to get Aaron and then that, that animal and have it all be 4k. In that moment, I don't really need bokeh yeah. at all. If everything's, it's fine. I just want a crisp, clean image and I want the low end so I can film the subject after he shoots the arrow and the animal runs off. I want to get back on him. Yeah. Well, with the 70 to 200, I got to like walk 10 feet away from you to just get your head in the frame, yeah. which is a pain in the butt. And I, I think it's important to mention that um, if you will know what type of a photographer, videographer you are, if your heart is set on video before you get started, I'd cater to your purchase to, to video. Um, mm-hmm. My heart was never, I never liked video. And the thing is, yeah. is that the decisions you make in your initial purchases, because they're so expensive, are important. So you need to make sure what you think. If you want night shot photos, if you like Grady, Grady mm-hmm. can take a good photo, but he's yep. a videographer. Yes. You know what I mean? Me, I can't really say I can take a good video, but I'm a photographer. That is my thing. So make sure, as Brian's talking about, uh, your choices in lenses, things like that are based off of even when you're getting started off of what you think you're going to want to do because that's probably what you're going to end up doing or where your heart's going to be at. Yes. Otherwise, you'll be poor. Yep. (laughs) The other thing that's crazy good about the Sony, besides that low light, the clear image zoom, the 4K, is the Sony can do slow motion, like real slow motion. 120 frames per second is is pretty dang slow. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of the other cameras out there don't have that slow motion option. Now, when you go to 120 frames per second, the downside is uh, it's no longer recording in 4K. Uh, JPEG. Um, So it'll pop it down to like 1080, um, which most of my footage I actually publish at that rate. Mm -hmm. uh, So it's okay. But, um, But I'm getting some really cool slow motion. Yeah. Um, And then... The other thing about it is uh, with the Sony that I've learned, there's all those custom buttons, which you can program so you can quickly just get to your white balance, boom, with one button yep. and adjust it really quick on the fly. Um, other thing I have custom button for is uh, uh, zoom mode. Mm-hmm. Like maybe I want to go really quick from center focus to everything in focus. Uh, there are a lot of different zoom uh autofocus modes. Yeah. I can choose those. The zoom custom button. Um, I mean, for me, I have on, uh, the custom buttons. I have my, my shutter speed, my, uh, exposure value, my aperture priority. Uh, these are all ones that are basically what I'm getting as I don't have to go to a sub menu to get to. Uh, my focal point is in there. Um, I also have my picture profile on a custom button. Mm-hmm. I have my, um, what am I forgetting? Yeah, I'm sure I'm forgetting something. But all of those are within fingers reach. Button. When you first get the camera and you're going through the sub formats, same with Olympus. Olympus is worse. And you're coming from a Canon, you're going to hate the Sony. Guaranteed. Hate it. It is, it is confusing. It's a bit cluttered. It's not, in my opinion, in the right order. Yeah. Like, you're not going from bam, 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 where it makes sense. You're skipping from like A, B, C, W, X, C, 7. <laughs> it's like, what the hell? But you can get it customized your, yourself, just sitting there and learning it and, and make it fairly functional. I agree. And as soon as you get those custom buttons dialed, life is 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 great. And I, I rarely ever go into the main menu. Um, the other thing is right here on the top, that dial Aaron talked about before in another podcast, you have aperture priority, shutter priority. I tell you, that camera takes amazing panoramics uh, for a pano. Mm-hmm. You know, pano, you're basically, well, you can make panos and posts, but from the camera, it's just splicing a bunch of photos together. I took four the other day, mm-hmm. um, and and uh, I don't know, a tripod, I mean, it takes good of them either way, but you couldn't tell they were spliced, where a lot of times you can see, if you know yeah. what you're looking at, you can see splices. Um, like you got half a dog and half a kid spliced together oh yeah exactly yeah amy looked three feet long like multiplicity she <laughs> yeah. she was moving in one of them but uh it, it i mean minus it's sucking battery life and mm-hmm. uh you know yeah arguably the sensor gets dirty i mean it has a lot of options but go ahead with the, the dial yeah so on the dial um you know you got your normal settings but one and two are really my my go-to nowadays um 
and I have set um, my one and two up, uh, so they're pretty awesome. Um, I like one I have set up, and then there's like four menus under one. You can have up to I think eight custom. It's a it's presets. A, it's a pile I'm on sure. this, so you turn it to one, and then there's like four more presets under that that you just with two clicks you're in it. So one is 4K 30 frames per second, mm -hmm. and then I have another one that's 4K 60 frames per second, mm -hmm. and then with the 60 frames per second I've gone in and already made my shutter speed one one twenty one one twentieth, mm -hmm. so that is two times my frame rate, and I've already set my um, my uh, uh, ISO where I want. So it's all preset for certain conditions. And then 120, the same thing is true for my uh, slow motion. Um, I've got my, my aperture set. Everything's already done. And so I have all those things preset so I can go slow motion. Yep. Uh, uh, or, you know, I can change it really quick to 4K, bright light, you know, and, and those things are already in there. And then I'm, I can easily uh, use the ND filter to kind of fine tune what I want. Yeah. Um, and all the other stuff is preset and it just makes it so easy to go through those menus. And you can move them from, it's not like they're stuck at that custom adjustment. Mine, the way I have mine set up is for night photos. I think I have it um, on the, for example, the shutter speed. Mm -hmm. I think I have it at, 16 seconds shutter but i just but then you can the just dial. it's a starting point for you like it's so i don't screw it up later it's basically i have my white balance set up correctly mm -hmm. um I, I actually yeah every it has everything preset to where i can't screw it up meaning the little things i'll forget too yeah it's crazy all the stuff that you can adjust in there but for me if i wanted to switch normally if i wanted to switch uh you know from from all of a sudden filming in 4k 30 frames per second i want to jump into slow motion mm -hmm. that in the past would take all these settings and changes mm -hmm. now i switch it to slow motion and boom all the variables change yeah how i want and i am on it and i catch that moment where a guy's catching a fish he's hooked up and the fish is jumping and i want to go from you know just filming uh him casting to now i want this super slow motion shot instead of 60 frames per second now i want 120 and i want to get that fish as it's coming out of the water boom i am there already in it recording and i'm getting this fish just jumping slow motion that stuff um is really cool with all those menu presets so where sony does have a, it's a pain in the butt with the all those different um the menu being sub, sub yeah menus. being horrible yeah. There's so many custom options on it that you can pretty much get yourself out of that menu altogether. Um, so I think that kind of covers how, you know, I've been using the camera at a, at a kind of a high level. Um, the other thing that people have been asking a lot of is around audio. And um, there's two things that... Uh, that I will be using going forward and I'll get back to folks on how, how, how it's working. That the bird cage, the, the cage. Yeah. I got a cage that goes around the camera so that I can mount some stuff to it. And the, the two things that I, I want to mount to that are uh, some audio equipment. So you can always run a video mic, a Rode video mic pro, which just, plugs um directly into the camera and um the way that i have learned that is um when you take the sony and you're running a, an external um video mic pro uh, shotgun mic <clears throat> the way that grady taught me and the way i'm liking the sound is he takes that sony and on the internal um audio recording level he zeroes it out all the way to zero, and then he gives it one bump up. Mm -hmm. And so basically, if you, uh, it's it's almost recording the the camera level the the audio recording level built into the camera. You've basically almost shut it off, just yeah. barely barely on. Then you take the the Rode Video Mic Pro, you plug that in, 
and you set it at plus 20 dB on the switch on the top. That seems to give a really um, nice sound. There's very little white noise. It's just a $200 mic and, and you've got pretty good sound. In the past, I guess I didn't figure that out. Sony and Canon, they all had different internal recordings, but they would, it would, it would kind of blow out the audio or, or have a lot of white noise and it overlap both. right? Yes. Yeah. And then some of them have, um, I don't know, some settings about wind and I just disable most of it. Yeah. So that's the cheap, that's the simple way. But last year, Aaron would, rec would walk around with a lapel pin, a lapel lav mic, a lavalier that I'd set up here on his neck. And then he had a little um, Zoom H1 that I'd hit record on with a couple, it's like, like takes one double A and it would re record like a hundred hours of MP3 or 400 hours of, of audio on the card. So Aaron would walk around and it would be recording the audio that, that he did, that he said, but in post it's a nightmare because I, I have to go back, find the audio clip that Aaron, what he said on the, on the audio. And then I've got to splice it or, or use pluralize is what I use. It's a application that, um, takes the video and the audio and syncs them together. It's just a, I was just thinking, yeah, because I, I did have that thing on for two hours, and I'd shut it off for 30 minutes, and then it's like you got to listen to all of it one way or another just to remember. Sometimes it was on for eight hours. Yeah. And you got to go in that eight hours and try to find the three-second sound bite. Yeah. You know, or 30-second or sound bite. So it, it makes it tough. So this year, I'm really working on making sure my post-production uh, work is more to a minimum. And I've been playing with the wireless Sennheiser. Mm -hmm. So now for audio, I, um, in the past I used a beach tech DS, DSLR XLR pro or something, which is a mixer. So the problem with this, the, the DSLRs and the, the mirrorless, the, the full frame cameras is that they do not have audio built in. That's worth a dang. No, it's horrible. So, you could put a mixer on the outside and it'll take an XLR microphone input and convert it to go into the little one eighth inch um, headphone jack type microphone um, input and put it into your camera. But it sometimes it's just got white noise. It sounds like crap. So um, for those who have a Sony AS, um, uh, A7S II, they have the Sony XLR K2M XLR adapter, and I I ordered that. I've used the Beach Tech for a while, and uh, but this one's built for the Sony, and that adapter um, has a shotgun mic that converts that XLR shotgun mic into audio right onto the card as you're filming real time. So I'm going to run that this year, and then I'm going to mic Aaron up or whoever my talent is with yeah. <laughs> with a Sennheiser <laughs> mic. Um, wireless and it uh, I've got the outdoorsman lapel <clears throat> microphone and um, I'm actually working on mounting it in the hat in the brim of the hat up here so like Aaron's shirt doesn't bump it or his you know like uh, it's kind of a, a pain um, in some places where your shirt ruffles it or whatever I've got a little little uh, dead cat kind of piece of foamy thing <clears throat> hair thing that goes over it to block the wind. And, and the goal is to get perfect audio coming out of Aaron. So when he drops some Snyderism or nugget of gold or, uh, that I, that I'm hearing that. And sometimes Aaron is 20 feet away. Yeah. And with the wireless mic, it's capturing that sound as though he's right next to the phone. My, my camera, even though he's not, so I can be 20 feet from Aaron, film him, shoot it, and um, but capture his audio as though he's like right next to me. And it also goes right into the camera real time on the card. So there's no syncing later. Uh, and it comes in as two channels. So if Aaron's audio up there, for some reason, the wind was whipping and it was just jacking with his mic or like it, 
whatever reason the sound from that is no good, I can just shut that channel off in post production because it's independent of my shotgun. Yeah. That way, um, I can disable his mic if I need to, or if Aaron's saying something that is not appropriate, I can still have the, um, which never happens. Frequently. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> the, then I, I can just engage the shotgun mic, but turn off Aaron's personal mic that'll for save, that. That'll save hours. For that one section, and then turn it right back on. It makes editing so much easier. Yeah. So that's how I plan to do that this year. Um, and, I, and I did that in the past, two years ago. I did that a lot with my Canon 70D. Um, but I wasn't really happy with the white noise sound that I would get or the Sennheisers because I didn't know how to use them. So again, it's back to knowing how to use your equipment. Now that I know how to use those things, I'm getting the sound I want. So the last thing is I hate the monitor. Oh yeah, because you you've got a back. You're you're getting an LCD screen that you can hook onto that bird cage, right? Yes. Yeah. So I have a seven inch LCD screen that hooks onto that cage that goes around the camera. And dude, like on the Canon 70D, I could turn it up, mm -hmm. and I could film Aaron's feet. You know, and I could, this, the screen will even rotate so that when you're in front of the camera, you can see if you're filming yourself, what yeah. the image looks like with the Sony, it sucks. The screen just pops, it just tilts up or it's flat flush. It, it doesn't come out. doesn't come off the camera. Really it doesn't turn around. doesn't twist. If I'm filming down low, I can't see it very well. And then it's an LCD screen, which looks like crap. Mm -hmm. uh, the image just doesn't. I can't tell. And then when you record in 4K on the Sony, the image, because of the battery and, and I guess how they have it set up, the image goes dim. Yeah. I was going to say it burns a lot of battery anytime you're yeah. previewing it too. A anything you're previewing it burns. So when it dims, I can't see the image in a bright day. And we were filming these bucks and I'm like, I'm trying to see the screen. I can't tell if they're in focus or not in focus because yeah. it's too dark. Yeah. And uh, when you're, when it's, you don't notice it when you're filming indoors, like filming a podcast. Yeah. Because you can see that image yeah, so clear. clearly. Yep. So, um, I've, I've decided, uh, I am no longer going to suffer along with that small screen. So I got the big screen and I'm hoping that, um, and I'll report back and see how that works, but. It's a big screen, so like you'll see these guys doing indie films and cinematic stuff. They have that big, large screen, and you can easily see if you're in focus, if you're out of focus, and it's true 4K image instead of an LCD screen. Yeah. So it tell it's showing me what the color is really going to look like on my computer or my TV when I get home. Right. Which the current one doesn't. No, it doesn't. It works fine for photos for me, but it's not the crispest thing in the world. Most yeah. Days. So... Um, and in the moment, like when I'm videoing, I have to capture that moment right then. And I, there's no redo when you catch a fish and you're reeling it in. And later I come back and I realize that it wasn't in focus the whole time. Yeah. And you, you couldn't see because the screen was just too dark. So um, I'm going with a bigger screen, brighter screen. The last thing is battery management. That is a huge that's the downside with these Sony's is they suck batteries like crazy. And during video you know, you might get 30 minutes out of a little battery. And sometimes you're recording an animal, you know, for an hour. You don't know when Aaron's going to actually take that shot. Yeah, because it's a percent. It's about a percent a minute in good days, but closer to you're usually using a percent every 30 to 45 seconds of battery life when you're filming, depending upon how everything's set up, um, which isn't, you know, that's not great. <laughs> yeah. In fact, we're running low on batteries right now. That's good. I need to take a nap. So the one thing that I was going to say is the way I have my camera rigged going into this season is I have a dark energy that is zip-tied onto my uh, tripod or onto the cage. Uh, and it's just it's zip-tied on there, and I've got my little USB cord that runs up to the camera to power the camera. Most of the time, I, will ne I won't use that because I'll just swap out the battery. Yeah. But if I'm in the heat of a moment that's critical, I can quickly just grab that cord, plug it in, and I have endless four or five hours of, audio of recording time. 
yeah. endless battery. Yeah. And I've seen, you can see that set up a lot in photos if you type in like whatever. And I think most images. guys don't think about it because um, it's a photo shoot or, you know, they're not running gun filming like you are in the wilderness. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've, like if you Google, you know, whatever battery mm-hmm. issues, Sony, it, anyway, you'll see some images of people doing videos and they'll have something tied up hanging or whatever for an external battery pack or whatever. Just, uh, um, yep. yeah, I don't know. Some of them look like Mophie. Some of them, um, there was one dark energy hanging from one I looked yep. at. I don't have to worry about any of that cause I'm taking photos. So I just, I pack eight batteries with me, six, whatever I need and swap them out, but I'm not filming, which is a whole new issue. Yep. So I'll bring all those spare batteries and then the dark energy, like I said, I've got it, you could duct tape it on, whatever you want, but it's, I've got a couple of them and they're just stuck to either my tripod or the cage. And, uh, it's just that emergency power unit when it's needed. Yeah. Um, I think that kind of covers it other than, uh, I, I, I like all the same lenses Aaron has, but I also have this last one, which is the, uh, this 70 to 200, 200 millimeter 2.8, the Sony, uh, G, G master lens. And, uh, this thing is, um, like I said, it's probably the lens I use 99% of the time, uh, 90% of the time. And then the other lens that I use for, for just B-roll and around camp and all that, I'm going to have the same lens Aaron has, which is that 1.4. 35 millimeter lens. Yeah. Um, and, and then, you know, I'll add some more to it. I'd like to have a really an 18 millimeter at some point. I like the baddest 2.8. Um, and then as for zoom, I do have a Canon 1.1 uh, 1 to 400 millimeter lens with a Metabones adapter, or I've used the photo deox, but I think I'm going to switch, um, that, it gives me one to 400 millimeter optical zoom. And then, uh, I haven't tested clear image zoom on it, but if it works as it's supposed to, yeah, it's going to go from a 400 millimeter lens to an 800 millimeter lens without losing any F stops. Yeah. And you do run into, I wouldn't say run into, not all some aberration metabone, or, Oh, just oh. not all metabones adapters are made equally i guess some of them have some pretty major problems some don't so mine sucks yeah you f- you find that a lot Oops. some of them are pretty crappy i think we lost some power there anyway that's it let's wrap up because we're losing battery uh go buy yourself a hero five and a karma grip that thing buy four, four hero fives I-, I just think they're so convenient they handle the rain they're amazing. Yeah, they're good. Yeah, and if you have any questions on anything we've covered, feel free to email or send us a message. We may not get to it in a hurry, but we'll try. Um, yep. Yeah, no, I, we appreciate all the support from everyone, and uh, definitely um, it's good to see people get into photography. So yeah, if nice. you got any questions, send them our way, and uh, we'll try to answer them on a on an upcoming podcast, just camera questions podcast to clarify some of this stuff. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, guys. Yep, stay gritty. Stay gritty. Dude, I was about to fall asleep. I gotta go home and take a nap. The future of public lands. All of us own them, all of us use them. Political activists are demanding us to hand over the public lands where the state's legislators could transfer and control these lands. U.S. citizens own 640 million acres of public lands, which creates 6.1 million jobs and generates $646 billion per year. States have been selling off land to pay bills for over 100 years, thus closing access to the public. 39% of original 64 million acres have been sold. The cost of land management would break most state budgets. For instance, who will pay the hundreds of millions of dollars to fight major wildfires each year? It doesn't matter how many promises are made. The financial reality is it will force states to have to sell off our public land. President Theodore Roosevelt said, we must preserve our lands for future generations, not merely to the people now alive but to the unborn people. Our duty to the whole bids us restrain an unprincipled present-day minority from wasting the heritage of these unborn generations.